Today on the John Ankerberg Show, did God give specific prophecies hundreds of years in advance about a special person he would send to earth called the Messiah? What specific prophecies did God give? Where can they be found in the Hebrew Scriptures? Did the Jewish people to whom the prophecies came recognize that they had been given special promises that pointed to a coming Messiah? In this series, we will examine 16 prophecies given to the Jewish people from Adam to Abraham, from Moses to David, from Isaiah to Daniel and Zechariah. We will ask, do these remarkable prophecies prove Jesus is God's Messiah? My first guest is Dr. Walter Kaiser. He is one of the leading theologians and biblical scholars on the Hebrew Scriptures in America today. Dr. Kaiser is President Emeritus and Distinguished Professor of Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Hamilton, Massachusetts. And second, Dr. Daryl Bach. He is one of the leading theologians and biblical scholars on the New Testament text. He is Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies and Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas, Texas. Join us for this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. We're going to talk about an extremely important topic today. Is there evidence in history that God gave specific prophecies hundreds of years in advance, some thousands of years in advance, about a person He would send to earth called the Messiah? What specific accounts are given and where can they be found? And did the Jewish people to whom the information came, did they recognize that they had been given special information, special promises that pointed to a person in the future? We have got the greatest guest today, Dr. Walter Kaiser, as you've just heard, is President Emeritus and Distinguished Professor of Old Testament at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in Hamilton, Massachusetts. He's the author of 40 huge books, Dr. Daryl Bach, Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies and Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at Dallas Theological Seminary in Dallas. He's the author of over 30 books. The world of scholarship knows these guys. And I am so happy because they can put the cookies on the bottom shelf. They can take the hard stuff and that's what we need. And uh, we're going to start today with defining the word Messiah. What does it mean, Dr. Kaiser? Well, John, it's a delight to be with you. Uh, Messiah is the great word that uh, of, speaks of the anointed one. There were anointed priests, there were anointed prophets, there were anointed kings, but most of all, there was the anointed one who came as the uh, Messiah, the Lord Jesus himself. And in Jewish writing, uh, they point to the Tanakh or the Old Testament and they found over 500 passages that uh, they claim were uh, messianic. Uh, within the Protestant community, we can at least identify 125 direct prophecies of this anointed one or Messiah. All right, now when we come to the Old Testament, there's <clears throat> rules to the road as to how you examine the data, all right? And part of that is you've got the predictions themselves, what was actually said. And that's, that's a whole ball of wax by itself. Yeah. Then you've got what are the promises in terms of going forward? You've got a historical situation where yeah. people are hearing this. What did those people think when they heard this stuff? And then the history that we can actually document, how did this progress down the line? Give me your rules to the road, and then I'm going to ask Daryl for his. There are three important moments in every one of these uh, uh, predictions about the Messiah. There's first of all the promise spoken ahead of time. Then there is the means, the historical means, by which God kept this alive uh, throughout the ages. And then there was the uh, fulfillment. So we've got at least three main features to keep our eye on, and that's what the 39 books of the Tanakh or the Old Testament are all about. What would you add to that, Daryl? 
Well, the main thing here is, is to take mm -hmm. these uh, prophecies and think about them in two ways. Some of them are direct predictions. The speaker is speaking directly to the situation long in the future, and there's one target, if you will. Uh, but the others are what are called pattern or mirror prophecies. The technical term is typology, and the idea is there's an event in the short term that looks like what it's also going to be like at the end, except the short-term event usually is kind of a faded or subtle light, whereas when you get to the fulfillment at the end, you've got a bright light. It's, it's, it's this pattern in, in intensified, and that tells you that you're finally to the real deal. Give me two illustrations, one for each. Well, the direct prophecy, perhaps the, the clearest direct prophecy, is the picture of the Son of Man being see, riding the clouds, coming to the Ancient of Days in heaven. That's a very direct prediction of a sharing of authority that God has with this other figure. Which we're going to look at, Daniel. That's mm -hmm. right, that's in Daniel 7. And then the other passages, there are numerous of them, but the image of the Exodus and the New Exodus is probably the more common one, associated with the precursor who comes before the Messiah. The, uh, Isaiah is pictured as one who who helps clear the way in his time, and John the Baptist is the one who helps clear the way for Jesus in his time. Both use the image of the Exodus to help us get there. All right, now folks, that you, those of you that are listening at home, I wanted to make this as simple as possible so we could follow it. And we've put down like 16, 17 prophecies that we're going to actually show you on the screen as we go along. We're not going to all do them today. And I want you to realize as we go step one, step two, step three, that God has put his own case for the Messiah into the Old Testament. They're like clues on a mystery man. Who's the mystery man that God's pointing to that's coming in the future? And he's got clue one, clue two. If you only got two clues, it's kind of tough. But the more you narrow it down, the more information you get, you get to this one that you shouldn't miss. Now let's take the first one, Dr. Kaiser. The first promise is Genesis 3.15, and here's what it says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, God is speaking here, yeah. and between your offspring and hers. Then it says, He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Yeah. All right, explain that. Yeah. Uh, John, this is a great promise because from the very beginning, after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, this same Lord is going to make a plan of rescue and uh, salvation. So he says, I, God, will put hostility, enmity, which is always person to person, uh, between uh, you, the serpent, and the woman. One, the, uh, you, the serpent, versus the woman, number two. But then, surprise, he says, between the serpent's offspring and the woman's offspring. But then, all of a sudden, that offspring is narrowed down and there is a male descendant, and very clearly in the uh, Hebrew text it says, number one, the serpent, you, will uh, strike his heel, but uh, uh, that uh, male descendant, he will crush the head of the uh, serpent. So we are told from the very beginning, this is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first announcement of the good news of the gospel, and it is that this Messiah is going to win, come all of history. What would you add? Well, the context of this is important, and the way in which these passages work are also important, because the, what we have here is the beginning of what's known as the curse at the fall, the consequences of disobeying God. And in the consequences of disobeying God, what went from being a very good garden all of a sudden had tension introduced into it. And with that tension introduced, there was conflict. This serpent had, was not originally a ground crawler. He was uh, upright. So when he went down and hit the ground as part of the curse, the picture is of a fight, of a conflict that now, a tension that's introduced into the creation where humanity is challenged, uh, is challenging this serpent and they're at war with one another. Well, when you fight with a serpent on the ground, you're trying to stomp their head with your heel and they're trying to nip your heel with their head. So that's the picture that's behind this, the conflict that's a part of the curse, which the resolution of it is this victory that uh, Walt has just mentioned. And Eve, when she had her first child, she had some inkling on this thing, didn't she? 
You know, in chapter 4 of uh, Genesis, it says that Adam knew his wife Eve, uh, which is carnal knowledge in that instance, and she conceived and bore a son, and she called his name God, or uh, that's the translation of Cain, because she says, I've gotten a man, and as Luther, and as the Hebrew says, even the Lord. So her instincts were right. Uh, she was looking for that Messiah, uh, that male descendant, but her timing was bad. It was way, <laughs> way off. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to look at the second one. Who did Noah predict would someday come into the tents of one of his sons, Shem? All right, this is fascinating. Remember, we're building a case. So clue number one, so we got a male descendant of the woman who's gonna crush Satan someday. How are we gonna add on to that? We'll be right back, stick with us. All right, we're back. We're talking about do the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, do they constitute proof about this one that's going to come, namely Jesus, as being the Messiah? And we're building a case. We've just taken clue number one, the first prophecy in Genesis 3.15. Now we're moving down the line. God is active in history, and Noah gives some information about his sons. you got Ham, Shem, and Japheth that came out of the ark with him. And when Noah is getting close to death, he pulls them all together and he says this about Shem, may God provide ample space for Japheth. May he, and that's the question, who's the he, dwell in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be his servant. Now unscramble that one for us, Dr. Kaiser. Well, this is the second great promise that God has given, uh, even in the early parts of the Bible. And the he here of this second phrase is uh, God himself, Elohim, who is the one who enlarged uh, Japheth, but now he promises the high and holy God of all eternity is going to come and pup tent tabernacle right in the midst of the tents of uh, Shem. So we know that he is going to use as an instrument the Semitic peoples. Which Semitic peoples, we don't know yet. But we do know that God has promised that he would come and dwell, which is much like John 1, 14. The Word became flesh and it dwelt amongst us. It's the same sort of illusion that you have here too as well. So it's a great promise, John. Yeah. Now, Daryl, the fact is when people are gathering this stuff, you think of Adam and Eve, they got one, okay, and you get Noah, and you're adding these things and the dear people back there that were listening to this, the stuff that was being said that God would do for the sons was very important. Yeah. Some of these things though go into the future. How did the folks at that time think about these things? Well, in some cases they probably missed the significance of what was being said because it's a little bit like having a puzzle at the start. I got a thousand pieces, I only got two or three pieces out on the table. I have no idea what I'm looking at yet. Uh, it's only when I get the other pieces around it that all of a sudden I realize, oh, that's the really important part of the picture. So sometimes uh, these prophecies are given and we look at them and we don't quite know how they fit as the story is starting to unfold. But when we go back uh, uh, upon further review, then all of a sudden we realize there's a lot more going on than we realized. Yeah. All right, I'm going to jump real quickly to Abraham as our next person, okay? And let me put the verse on the board. God makes eight promises, starting off here, to Abraham. And he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Then he gets promises about the land, but what we want to zero in on is not just those promises, but the one also in Genesis 22:18, which is picked up in the New Testament quite a bit. In your seed, God says, 
all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now, Walter, unscramble that one. Uh, here we've hit the jackpot. This is, <laughs> this is where the whole thing comes together. And uh, uh, God's been building this from Genesis 3, uh, 15, Genesis 9, 27, and now in Genesis 12, and actually four more times, five times, he has always in the climactic position a promise to Abraham. So which Semite was it? Well, it turns out that it's a Hebrew, and it is Abraham. God's going to bless him and make his name great. And why is he going to do this? For this purpose, so that in your seed all of the families of the earth might be blessed. It's passive. It always is passive. Uh, three out of the five times it uses the passive Hebrew verb and all the intertestamental, it's passive, be blessed. Not that they were going to bless themselves, but they were to be the channel, the means for this. So how is the whole world going to come to know about this Messiah? It will be through this line. And every one of the New Testament passages is passive too as well. So here is the, the great uh, sort of statement of where this plan is going. And he said, I've chosen my men, I've chosen my people, I've chosen what I want them to do, so I'm going to give them a great name. Everyone wants to have a name, a reputation. I'm going to bless them, but it's not to be consumed personally. It is for uh, the benefit of the, the whole world. And this is missions par excellence. This is the whole mission of uh, what God wanted to do on planet Earth. Talk about the singular use of seed versus the corporate use of seed. Well, this is again where the story gets interesting. Just like we had with Adam, we had a picture of humanity and then within it a victory. So we have a picture of a nation and within it someone emerging out of it who's significant. And so what you see is this idea, I'm going to have a, a promise of a seed, but later on in these passages we get discussion of the seed. You're going to be like the sands of the sea. You're going to be like the stars in the sky. It's clear that at one level seed is multiple. We're talking about the descendants into a nation, a nation through which the world will be blessed. But at the same time, in the midst of all these numbers that are being produced, there are particulars within it that are important. So we go to Isaac and Jacob and not folks like uh, Eliezer and Ishmael and Esau. So certain people, uh, the trail tracks with certain people and it doesn't track with others. And so we're getting this narrowing. We've got, we've got all humanity, then we come down to the Semites, then we come down to Abraham and his family. Now within Abraham and his family, there's a seed that's going to be a nation, but there's also a seed that's going to be an individual. Walter, talk about how the Apostle Paul picked up on this very verse in Galatians 3.16. The verse says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. Explain that. Yeah, that's exactly the, the point. And, and Paul knew this well. Uh, and he wanted the uh, Jewish audience and the Gentile audience to understand that when he spoke of this seed, he meant one. Now, obviously, the word seed is a collective uh, and uh, has a corporate idea, so it does embrace all. Matter of fact, he ends the same chapter in Galatians, and if you believe, then are you Abraham's seed? So, again, it is that whole multiple group. But par excellence at the head, the representative of the whole group, is none other than our Lord Jesus. And so he deliberately uses this collective idea so they can have the one and the many. And you've got to get that if you're going to get the point that the writer is making in Genesis and the writer in uh, the uh, epistles is making too as well. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to think of what we're talking about. I mean, to me, it's awesome when you look at this thing. God's involved in history, giving information as He goes along that affects both the people that are living at that moment and is also pointing toward the future. Now, 
Walter, we were talking about the promise to his seed that the Apostle Paul says eventually turns out to be Jesus Christ who rescues the world. But where I want to get to is there are other things that God promised Abraham. And let me just read it. He says, Abraham, no longer shall your name be called Abram, that was his first name, but your name shall be Abraham, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Now, here's the big one. I have made you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you. And then all of a sudden, God introduces this new clue, and kings will come forth from you. What's that all about? Well, this is another feature of the Messiah. We had his human origins in Genesis 3, the first promise. Then here he comes from heaven to dwell in the tents of men, his divine origin. Then he calls a man to minister to all of the peoples on the face of the earth so that they too might get blessed. And now he, he wants to tell this Messiah is going to be a ruler and a king, a potentate over the whole earth to rule the, the whole nine yards. And uh, so he begins to promise this. And already with Jacob, we have another indication. Here comes this messianic king. He's going to be the Messiah. And he is our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, and the descendants, God keeps narrowing down where the special one's going to come from. Go yeah. through the line again of how he's narrowing it down. Well, he narrows down from, uh, uh, in this case, Abraham to his son uh, Isaac and then to his son Jacob. So that gives us about uh, 250 years of the time of the fathers called the patriarchs. And uh, here's where we begin to get this story of the Messiah who's going to be King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and God of Gods. Yeah. Now, God promised Jacob, Isaac and Jacob that they would be blessed and the seed would come through them yeah. and God was going to hold on to the promises. Same one from Abraham to Isaac and Jacob. And Jacob, he also reiterated this thing about the kings. He said, and kings shall come forth from you. Yeah. So we have this kind of clue here, kings. We don't know much more than that, Daryl. How else would you talk about this? Well, I think it's important that we've got the phrase kings here. We're not talking about a king yet on its own. What we're talking about is a line, a dynasty. There's going to be a special set of rulers through which God is going to work. And eventually that's going to play itself out into a particular ruler who's going to deliver the goods, if you will. And so it's important as we deal with the story that, that we see that even in the midst of the narrowing down, that particular figure is emerging out of, a, out of a series of figures that we're going to be involved with. This is why the story of the Bible is so fascinating, because for, there's a period in which we'll go after king after king after king after king who doesn't match up, who, doesn't, who clearly is not this special figure, who doesn't deliver everything that God is promising. And so we keep looking for more. We keep looking for the faithful God to deliver on His promise faithfully. Daryl, summarize this in terms of, you know, what we've heard today and where are we going in the future? In other words, where are the verses taking us? What's the conclusion that we are trying to get across to the people? The earth is filled with people, uh, millions and millions and millions of people. But within those millions and millions across time, there is one around which the story of God revolves. And that's the point of this promise. Out of the many, we come down to the one, yeah. the one who's different than everybody else, the one to whom uh, and in whom God has invested his promises in his program, the one around whom uh, revolves all the issues of life. Out of the many, the one. The many are in the midst of life. The one is life. Mm -hmm. And so the point is you come to the life that God has designed for you by experiencing what this particular one provides for you. Yeah, and again, folks, we are marking the promises, the prophecies that God gave over this 2,000 year period of time that end up with Mr. X down here, who happens to be Jesus Christ. God's saying, I don't want you to miss him. Yeah. And as you listen to these, as we go on through these weeks, I want you to ask yourself, is this proof enough for you that Jesus is the one God sent into the world? And if he is, then you need to do some business with him. You need to put your faith and trust in the one who can forgive your sins 
and can and empower you to live the way he wants you to live. Now next week, two more fascinating prophecies. Who is David's Lord in Psalms 110.1? And who is the prophet like Moses? God says, is going to come into the world and you must listen to him or I'm going to call you to account. Deuteronomy 18. Fascinating. We'll have a few more with that as well. I hope you'll join us then. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's program. Let me say thank you for joining me today. If you enjoyed today's program and would like to watch it again, just go to our free John Ackerberg Show app or watch it at jashow.org. Today's series is entitled 16 Prophecies That Prove Jesus is the Messiah. It features Hebrew scholar Dr. Walter Kaiser and New Testament scholar Dr. Daryl Bach. In this series, we answer the questions, who is the seed, the offspring of the woman? Who will crush the head of Satan? Who is the promised seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that will bless all the nations? Who is the future prophet like Moses, of whom God says, you must listen to him? Who is the child born that is God, who will have an everlasting kingdom? We also taped a second series entitled 16 Messianic Prophecies That Prove Jesus is the Messiah, Part 2 in which we learn the specific city the Messiah will be born, how he will die and resurrect from the dead. We will also ask, upon whom did the Lord lay the iniquity of all mankind? Who was assigned a grave with criminals, but ended up in a rich man's tomb? Who was the anointed one who was cut off 483 years after the command to rebuild Jerusalem? Who is the one who is eternal, who will be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata? And who is Jehovah, the one they have pierced, for whom Jerusalem and all the nation of Israel will someday weep and mourn? And again, folks, you may watch any of these episodes free on our John Akerberg Show app, or you may download each episode for only $5 an episode at our website at jashow.org. And finally, I'd like to invite you to receive our email newsletter of upcoming guests and programs. Or if you'd like, you can become a member of our worldwide inner circle of friends. Just let me know at our website at jashow.org. I'll be glad to hear from you. Uh, we went gone from all humanity to the Semites, down to the family of Abraham. Now we're inside his children. Inside his children, out of the, there were eventually 12 tribes of Israel. Out of those 12, there's one. You look for this special figure coming through the line of Judah. To learn how to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, go to our website at jashow.org and click on Pray to Accept Jesus Christ as Your Savior.